morning, everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force on September 20th, uh, 2021. Uh, we'll start with the land acknowledgement. Before we begin this meeting, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Semiamu people who have cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. I'll call the meeting to order. My name is Stephen Gockley. I'm co-chair of the task force. Um, I wanna say first that my uh, fellow co-chair, Jack Hovenier, is not able to join us this morning. Jack is tending to some personal and family business, and he apologizes for his absence. Um, and uh, we have uh, a number of special guests this morning, uh, Dr. Alexis Harris from the University of Washington, uh, Representative Sharon Shoemake from the 42nd Legislative District, and Representative Alex Rammel from the uh, 40th Legislative District. And maybe as a courtesy to them, uh, we could go around and introduce ourselves by name and what our affiliation is so that they can uh, see the membership of the task force. Jill, do you just want to cue people uh, in, in whatever order you want? Yes, I can do that. Uh, when I call your name, please unmute and introduce yourself. Barry Buchanan. Good morning, Barry Buchanan, Whatcom County Council. Bill Elfo. Bill Elfo, Whatcom County Sheriff, thank you for being here. Arlene Feld. Arlene, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, Arlene Feld, I'm co-chair of the Law and Justice Committee. Heather Flaherty. Good morning, Heather Flaherty here as a citizen representative. Uh, Seth Fleetwood, is Mayor Fleetwood here today? Uh, Judge David Freeman, are you here today? Deborah Hawley, are you here today? No. Mike Hilly? Yeah, good morning. Mike Hilly, uh, Emergency Medical Services Manager for the county, and uh, I particip particip excuse me, participate on the Behavioral Health Committee. Uh, mayor Cordice, Scott Cordice. Scott Cordice, uh, the mayor of City of Linden. Byron Mannering. Hello, all. Welcome. This is Byron Mannering from Bridget Collins Family Support Center. Moonwater. Moonwater, uh, director of the Whatcom Dispute Resolution Center. Darlene Peterson. Darlene Peterson, Bellingham Municipal Court. Dave Reynolds. Good morning, I'm Dave Reynolds, the director of uh, Whatcom County Superior and Juvenile Court. Eric Ritchie. I'm Eric Ritchie, Whatcom County Prosecutor. Flo Simon. Good morning, Flo Simon, Bellingham Police Chief. Maya Vanyo. Good morning, Maya Vanyo from the Whatcom County Defender's Office. Dan Hamill. Good morning, Dan Hamill, Bellingham City Council, co-chair of Behavioral Health Committee. And I have one attendee na simply named Seth. Mayor uh, Fleetwood, is that you? You're allowed to speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, I will promote you here. to the panelists. Okay, I'm here. That's me, I guess. Uh, Raylene King. I'm King, Blaine Municipal Court Administrator, Small Cities Representative. Uh, Representative Rammel. Morning, Alex Rammel from the 40th District. 
Representative Shumake. Good morning, Sharon Shumake from the 42nd District. Dr. Harris. Good morning, Professor Harris at the University of Washington. All right, if I have missed anyone, please just go ahead and unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I'm Greg Winter, Executive Director of Opportunity Council. I'm Chief Tanksley from the city of Blaine. Good morning, Perry Mowry, Human Services Supervisor, worked with Ann Deacon and uh, I'm covering for her after her um, retirement. Good morning, I'm Lieutenant Erickson with the Sheriff's Office and I am the Chair of the Index Committee. We miss anyone. Thank you, everybody, for being here uh, for what I hope is a, an informative and a useful uh, meeting. We're going to start, as you can tell from the agenda, um, with a presentation and some time for discussion with uh, Dr. Alexis Harris. Um, Dr. Harris is a professor of sociology at the University of Washington and the presidential term professor there. Uh, her doctorate is from UCLA in 2002. Um, her work uh, focuses on uh, criminal justice system, including juvenile justice, case processing outcomes, and monetary sanctions. Um, she's become uh, particularly uh, well known to the public in the last few years for uh, research fundamentally centered on issues of inequality, poverty, and race in the US systems of justice, including concentration on racial disproportionality and legal financial obligations. Her, uh, her current book, A Pound of Flesh, Monetary Sanctions as a Punishment for the Poor, details the way in which sentence fines and fees often put an undue burden on disadvantaged populations and place them under even greater supervision of the criminal justice system. Uh, this work has got regained widespread media coverage uh, across the country. Um, and so her, her work fo focuses on qualitative research method, methods, race and inequality, social stratification, uh, criminal justice systems processing, and a number of uh, areas uh, related to those. Um, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Harris here today. Um, besides the racial disproportionality uh, aspect of her research work, um, we were particularly drawn to the way that she has um, uh, plumbed the, uh, the difficult cavern of uh, criminal justice data systems to support her research. And since that's been an, uh, an equal area of uh, emphasis for the task force in the last year, uh, uh, we asked her to come and speak to us on, on both the, the racial inequality that her research uncovers and the way that she has worked with criminal justice data or lack thereof um, in hopes that it can inform uh, our work here locally in Whatcom County. Dr. Harris, welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the introduction and, and being invited to speak to you today. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen with you all. Okay, there we go. Um, I, you know, I wasn't sure if I, you know, I wanted to give some context of who I am. So for the outline, I'm going to begin really briefly um, since you all uh, just heard my bio, but a little bit of a context of the, the research that I do, um, and then dig into what data I've used in Washington State to put on the table some issues for you all to think about. Um, and I, I want to know, I don't have all the answers. I just tried to, what I call the kitchen sink um, sort of data uh, sourcing to, for my book to, uh, and to inform my research, and then open it up for a discussion with you all. Um, I am going to make it so I can't see you all. So if you have a question, please just um, 
unmute and 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 raise your question. I'm completely comfortable with that. I work with 300 students at a time uh, on college campuses, so I'm I'm used to being uh, interrupted and ask and ask questions. So just a, a background of, of who I am. I have been a professor at the University of Washington since 2004 in the Department of Sociology, and I teach the main courses are large lectures, intros on social problems, and then race and ethnicity in the United States. Um, my research has spanned from um, juvenile transfer, different states call them different things, but waiver, decline processes of minors from the juvenile court to the adult criminal system. That was what my dissertation focused on. Um, and I've worked on community reentry post-incarceration, so primarily doing observations of reentry programs and interviews with folks who are either in work release or recently uh, fully released from incarceration. Um, and I'll connect that with some, some work that you, I think that you all are involved in too. And then for the last 14 years, my work has really focused on monetary sanctions or legal financial obligations, as we call them in Washington state. And these are the fines and fees and restitution that are sentenced to individuals upon citation or conviction. The methods that I use are, are mixed methods, but I'm primarily trained in qualitative methods. So I do interviews, surveys, and observational, mostly court observations at this point in my career. Um, however, I really think that to get at understanding existence of disproportionality and disparities that we need quantitative statistical analyses as well. So I work with a number of uh, colleagues and graduate students who um, call the, the, the quantitative, the court automated data for statistical analyses as well. So I can speak to that. Um, just I wanna give some fun facts because it's nine o'clock on a Monday morning. I'm also at the University of Washington called the faculty athletic rep. So I work closely with the University of Washington um, athletic department. And then I have developed a faculty development program. So I'm working with faculty incoming this year to make sure that they're successful and happy. Um, in addition to like my UW role, I like to engage in public scholarship. So I like to have my research matter in different ways. So currently I'm working with the Washington Cadet Training um, Facility to develop curriculum around um, sort of teaching cadets about disparities, um, disproportionality, race and racism, structural racism in different institutions. Um, recently, I spoke at a federal hearing um, on monetary sanctions. I am the uh, chair of the Washington State Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights. And our recent focus has been on uh, excessive use of force in Washington State. Um, and then one thing I thought I see that you're connected with LEAD now is I, um, on some of my earlier research, working at on re-entry studies, uh, worked with and as a community member, a program called Clean Dreams, which was the first iteration of LEAD. It's not often not talked about, but it was here in South Seattle where we had a community advisory board. We worked with local police and created opportunities for pre-arrest diversion programs in our community. Um, so I can talk more about that later, but so that's who I am and, and what I like to do. Okay, so let's dig into the Washington State um, data. I'm gonna put you guys down here so you can see it. So um, my most recent study uh, was called the Multi-State Study of Monetary Sanctions. And it, it was a mixed method study of state, county, and municipal legal financial obligations. Uh, we are funded by Arnold Ventures from 2015 to 2021. And we tried to cover uh, uh, multiple layers of the court system. My book just focused on criminal um, superior courts in Washington state. Um, this study really, I wrote it to try to replicate and expand um, outside of just criminal courts, but in courts of limited jurisdiction, muni courts, traffic courts, um, and across states. So we had eight states in, in my team. Um, and you can see the states here, Washington, California, Texas, Minnesota, Missouri, Illinois, and New York. Um, we had a wealth of data that we've collected. We did observations of sentencing hearings and sanctioning hearings. So when a person is sentenced to LFOs and then what happens when they don't pay, um, 200 hours per site. And then over 950 interviews um, with uh, and surveys with people who owe debt and then also half of those inter set, that big set of interviews were with prosecutors, judges, defense attorneys, clerks, and probation officers in all of our states. Um, and then we also attempted to compile um, statewide multi-year automated court data um, in all of our states. And we learned a great lesson about how hard, I, you know, I think I was pretty naive when I wrote the grant, how hard it was gonna be to get these data across all of our states. 
Um, so the data that we used for Washington State was from the Administrative Office of the Courts, AOC. We had individual level data on traffic to felony fines, fees, restitution for 8.5 million cases, 3.4 million people from uh, 2007 to 2014. Um, our data agreement ended with AOC, so I no longer have access to those data, but we have um, requested a new batch of data from even earlier, I think 1990 to 2020, um, because I have a new grant with Arnold that hasn't been announced yet, but it's a three-year grant to look at some other issues that I can talk about later. Um, one of the ways that we've used these data are we've merged with the home addresses for people charged and, um, for some of our analyses, and we had address data. So we um, had around 2.8 million cases or 1.8 million geocoded individuals. So I'll show you one of the types of uh, spatial analyses that we did with the data that I think can get in a different way at racial and ethnic disparities. Um, and we aggregated 144 uh, seven Washington state track. So that'll make sense when I show you the, the analysis. We also link these data with other types of data. So um, for one particular project, we linked them with the American Community Survey, five year, and it was a five-year survey um, from 20, 2005 to 2009 um, to 2012 and 2016, and we were able to link with our LFO data. So this, again, will make sense. I'll, I'll give you an example. So you're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? But it allows us, when you have certain types of administrative data from the state, you have certain identifiers, and that can allow you to link with other pockets of data that can be more can um, allow you more nuanced analyses of what's happening in those individuals' lives and also the communities that they come from. Um, this is just an example of how we've used some of the data. Um, the, this was, again, my focus is on fines and fees. So we looked across court type um, of uh, amounts that were, this is amounts collected and outstanding that you can just see, you know, we found it's interesting to break up, um, you're, well, you're in one county, but if you're looking across the state, um, how the different courts use different types of legal mechanisms and how those might dis, um, differently impact different populations depending upon the site, the location of either if you're looking at uh, county courthouses, for example, in your county um, and also municipalities in your county. Um, again, we were able to look over time at changes, which are always interesting. Um, I think uh, Stephen uh, mentioned this at the beginning, right? You really want longitudinal data so you can look for changes over time. Um, and then type of cases that um, of interest to you. And then here we had um, the race and ethnicity data. And this is a figure per, per capita rate of LFO sentencing in superior courts by race ethnicity in Washington superior courts for uh, 2014. And so we could look at here, this is uh, Asian Pacific Islander. This is the black column. This is uh, the Latinx, uh, Native American and white column. And this tells us the average per capita amount that was sentenced um, by these categories. Um, so we see about $15 per capita was sentenced to black people in Washington state um, in 2014, about 690 for uh, Latinx, um, 960 for Native American. So this just shows us on the aggregate per um, average um, the differences in the amounts that were sent in. So this is one way you could try to get at this proportionality. Again, this is the per capita rate of LFO balances, so the amount that was owed, so the debt. We talk a lot about penal debt in my research, not just about the, about the amount that were sentenced, but the balance that people carry. And you can see the um, large differences in debt, penal debt owed by different racial and ethnic groups. Um, and another way that we can kind of look at um, disparities with the data that we have is we look at um, the time it takes for someone to pay off their debt by racial, racial and ethnic categories. And you could see um, many people were able to pay in full, but when you start looking at the older debt that's um, outstanding, you see different racial and ethnic groups having higher um, averages of outstanding penal debt. Okay, so there are a lot of layers of debt. I'll give you a couple more examples of how we've used this data to research racial and ethnic disparities, but I wanna to point to some issues that are important to think about. As you know, there are various layers and locations of data. So there's arrest data, there's prosecution data, there's conviction data, and there's sentencing data. And for us, AOC captured both um, sentencing data, conviction and sentencing data. So we could have that over time, longitudinal for different cases. Um, at times you can translate the, the data from cases to individuals. If you have 
certain identifying information that will allow you to do that. Sometimes it's interesting to look at, you know, by case processing. Sometimes it's interesting to look at by individual and how that individual is processed through the system. What's missing uh, in a lot of data in general is police use of force. This is a big issue. Again, I, I mentioned with the commission, the Washington State Advisory Commission for Civil Rights that I chair, we found that um, there, are, there are not a lot of data. Um, I'll, I just got an article on Friday that's embargoed, but so I won't pay too much, but it's an interesting article because it really shows differences in types of data and, and what's underreported in the data. Um, another issue when, that I'm particularly interested in is the issue of warrants. Um, it's hard to capture that. I don't have those in AOC data, but it's really important, I think, to understand how warrants are used in different jurisdictions and how they may be um, used differently for different populations. Um, again, I'm also interested in police excessive use of force, and warrants are a key mechanism that lead to contact in communities with individuals that can then lead to higher rates of excessive use of force for certain individuals. Um, another question that I've had a lot of hard times trying to find out is why certain individuals are in jail. You know, we know that some are pre, um, pre adjudication, some are there for short term um, sentencing, but others are there for, you know, failure, failure to appear. Some counties were issuing failure to pay warrants. Uh, and then warrant pickup. So it's really interesting to try and disentangle reasons for why people are there. And that's another nuanced space within the criminal legal system where racial and ethnic disparities can pop up, but we aren't able to capture those in the data. Um, another is where's the data and how are they linked? So Washington, we have AOC, but many municipalities in Washington do not report to AOC. So for example, Seattle Muni Court does not report their data to AOC. So we miss those data and we went straight to Seattle Muni Court to access their data and did an analysis for them in order to get their data um, so that we could include it in our, in our, um, our study. Um, police data are hard to access. I've never actually um, tried to formally go after it because it just seems difficult. Um, I know that there was a recent um, statute in the Washington State Legislature where there is movement to create both an internal and external facing um, system regarding police excessive police use of force data. Um, and that's moving forward, which I'm excited to see how that will be created and who will have access particularly to individual level data. And then municipalities, again, and they have different types of data systems, and sometimes they aren't linked to county or to state. So that's a big problem. I don't have an answer for that, um, but I want to put that on the table. Um, another sort of couple sets of issues I wanted to, to raise that I, th I think um, that helped set the table for digging into the weeds around differences in racial and ethnic categories. And one thing it's, you know, as I teach this topic, it's really important to remember that race these categories that we use in the United States around race are socially constructed. So what that means is that the official categories around race and ethnicity are imposed by the, the government, right? And they are these categories that have been created through the US census and they've varied uh, over time and space. Currently, or for the 2010 census, these were the categories that were used, white, black, African-American or Negro, American Indian or Alaska Native, um, and then uh, th you'd have a category of Asian Pacific Islander and could put that in. Um, 2020 census also asks white and black respondents for more detail of their origins. But in general, there are these five categories that are used in official United States surveys and documents. So the one category is American Indian or Alaska Native, another is Asian, another is Black or African American, another is Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and then white. Um, but again, it's important, and I didn't put it in this talk, um, but I can share more slides with you on this, this topic, is that, you know, for me, for example, I uh, have ancestry of African American, Filipino, and white. Um, so in, you know, the late 1800s, I would be categorized as just pure Negro because of my skin tone and one eighth. But today I have the opportunity to identify as multiple races and ethnicities uh, if I choose to. And so this makes it messy. It's a social construct. It's created by whomever is allowing these categories to exist and construct them. 
that said, our categories aren't real, but there are real um, uh, consequences for how people are racialized in our society. And everybody's racialized. White people are racialized. People of color are racialized. We're all racialized and there's different types of outcomes for us across any institution. I can show you the data, healthcare, education, criminal legal, you name it. We all fall into a different sort of um, area of uh, concern, right? Some, some are very successful um, and others fail. And that is linked to the racial categories that we are placed in. It doesn't mean it's because of our biology, but it's the social nature of our racialized um, categories. So that's race. Another category on the US census is Hispanicity or Hispanic origin. And this is termed the ethnicity question. And so this is the 2010 question and it's asking people about their Hispanic origin. And I'd just like to note that um, the term Hispanic at times is, is um, felt as, um, as inaccurate to describe people who consider themselves Latinx. Latin, Latino, Latina, Latinx is from Latin America and more inclusive of the Caribbean, of Afro uh, Latinos, um, where his Hispanic origin assumes some type of Spanish influence. And, and in reality, right, the, this is socially constructed again, right? It doesn't map on to how people identify themselves. So a lot of data will have the racial categories and will then have Hispanicity or Lat Latino category. Um, so there's a lot of problems in the administrative data to capture the nuances of lived realities for individuals. The administrative data usually uses the census-based racial categories and doesn't have uh, Latino or Latina categories. That's usually ascribed by a decision maker to someone. So sometimes, you know, it depends on the question. Early on, and I don't understand why this happened, I, I divulge a lot of personal stuff here. One, uh, this was several years ago, I got pulled over by a police officer and he asked me how I identified and he said that they were collecting data. This was in Seattle and I don't know if that's still happening, um, but it was really interesting that he asked me to self-identify myself. And so when we think about if we look at disparities or disproportionality in data, does it matter that somebody else is um, ascribing the racial or ethnic category in the person and will they be misidentified or should people themselves identify? What are we missing? with either two processes is, is an important question to ask. Um, and data usually lacks ethnicity or indige indigeneity distinctions, right? Um, people who are Native American or Latinx are frequently confounded with white categories. And so that means that there will be an underreporting if it exists, right? An underreporting of disproportionality or disparities. Um, okay. So one way that in terms of like the AOC data or nationally, a lot of people use something called a surname analysis to try and pull out people of Latinx ancestry. Um, and also some Asian American categories, you can do it too, out of the broader data, just the, the data that has racial identities on it. Um, it's a potentially useful technique. Um, so as I said, race is a social construct, but groups are treated differently. Um, surname analysis uses an individual's last name to estimate the likelihood that the individual belongs to a particular racial or ethnic group. So essentially there's an algorithm, there are algorithms that you can run on your data that contain common Spanish last names. Um, and then you can recode, you can create a new column in your data that recodes certain folks as uh, la uh, Latino or Latina. Um, the surname analysis is also used for um, different Asian ethnicities as well, and it usually relies on both the first name and the last name to make distinctions amongst different ethnic groups in the Asian, uh, the, this humongous broad a uh, Asian category that's used. Um, so we, do, we did that with our AOC data, and we'll do it again when we get a new batch um, to create that column in our data. Another point, and I've been saying both words, but I want to make it really clear, it's really important um, that we talk about the difference between what disproportion, disproportion, disproportionality means versus disparities. So dispropor these are different terms and we shouldn't confound them, especially when we want to be precise on what's happening in processing and outcomes uh, in what we're studying. So disproportionality is over-representation. So if, for example, in Washington state, Black people or African-Americans comprise 
4% of the state population, but 18% of those in jail and prison, that's disproportionality because that 18% is over representative of the po uh, population of black people in this state. Does not imply disparity. It does not imply that there's implicit, explicit racism, bias, what have you. It just states the numbers. There's an overrepresentation. It's really important that we take the next step to figure out why does that disproportionality exist? And that's trying to dig around for disparities. Do disparities exist? And disparity indicates that there's different treatment, policy processes that differentially affect one group more than another. And these could be race neutral policies. I remember early on in King County, I think it was in the early 2000s, they that had an aim in trying to reduce the disproportionality of African-American kids in detention. And they looked at their policies and processes and realized that one of them was um, a youth would be released or could be released if a parent could be called and reached on the telephone. Um, what they found is that disproportionately the black kids, they couldn't reach their parent or guardian on the telephone. Right back then in the early, we didn't have cell phones, right? And people were at work. So you couldn't reach them at work. And so that led to disparities in the types of kids that were being retained in the system. So disparities, right, can be malintention, right? It can be pure racism within a system, but it could also be differential policies and processes that lead to the overrepresentation of certain populations for different types of reasons. And that's why it's really important to suss out how, you know, if we see disproportionality in a certain part of our system, what are the, 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 um, the different tracks that lead to those outcomes? And then where are there different maybe practices that might over, lead to the overrepresentation of certain populations? Um, I guess, well, uh, well do, do you all have questions right now? I'm kind of dumping a lot, or do you want to save them? We will have time at the end of Dr. Harris's presentation, so. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll keep going, I'll keep going then. Okay, so those are the differences there. Um, I just also wanted to give two examples of how we've used the data to, um, to try to suss out racial and ethnic disparities. Um, as I showed you in the earlier slides, we have done analyses that looked at sort of changes over time by different racial and ethnic groups and how different groups might have been differently impacted by say having longer, um, longer um, periods of penal debt. Um, and then we've done two other types of analyses right now. One is looking at um, per capita rates by race and ethnicity in particular cities and then spatial analyses. So this was a report that I did with my colleague, Frank Edwards. And again, he's a statistician. Um, in 2020 for Seattle Municipal Court, we had access to their data and they asked us to do a report for the, um, for the city council. Um, and we presented to them and we found three, three um, findings. And, the, and most of this was pretty descriptive findings. Um, but first that people sentenced to criminal traffic cases tended to have LFO accounts open for longer periods of time compared to other types of cases. So traffic cases led to longer term debt for many individuals in the data. For each uh, class of case, black men and women were significantly more likely than their peers to be sentenced to incarceration through a Washington Superior Court following a paid and unpaid SMC LFO. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> it's a mouthful. What we found, we were really interested in trying to look at the, the consequences. And this is, was not a causal analysis, but it was more of a descriptive looking at the same cases. What happens when these when cases are in traffic court? What happens downstream to those same types of cases? And we found surprisingly that for black people in Seattle, they were significantly more likely than their peers to be sentenced to incarceration through a Washington Superior Court following both paid and unpaid Seattle Municipal Court legal financial obligations. So essentially it, it appears that in traffic court for black people, probably because of the inability to, to make payments, um, they end up in superior court. And that could be uh, driving uh, with DWLS3, driving with a license suspended in the third degree, right? You're not able to pay, you're driving dirty, if you will, and you get pulled over and you can in, across the state go to jail, but you definitely can get more of a, a serious conviction. Uh, Scott, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. 
Um, and then we also found that people of color had a higher likelihood than white people to be charged with a DWS3, a driving with a license suspended in third degree, following a Seattle Municipal Court legal financial obligation. And this was especially pronounced for black drivers. So in this way, looking at following cases through the system, we were able to pick up first on longer periods of debt owed for people who are black in Seattle Municipal Court, but then we could also see some relationship to what happened subsequently. And I think it's important to look at those nuances not just at each silo, right, of a system, but see what happens through that system. So the way that we kind of talk about it is traffic court being a gateway drug, if you will, for particularly Black people and people of color in Seattle to get to more serious processing, which is, is sort of scary, right? And we think that triggers the debt that they can't pay. Another analysis is what we call our debt blocks. Um, and we were really, so in my, in my book, I, I argue that legal financial obligations for poor people um, exacerbate existing conditions of poverty. And that came through a lot in the interviews I did with individuals um, and court observations, but I wasn't able to statistically show this. So this part of the, the Arnold project, um, and this is another part, a new project of the new grant that we will continue to do moving forward is really looking at debt, um, community level debt, right? Not just individual, but how does penal debt, LFOs, monetary sanctions impact neighborhoods? And so we did observe that LFOs per capita are spatially concentrated. You can look across Washington state and see different communities that have higher levels of LFOs sentenced in those communities. We also found that higher poverty neighborhoods also tend to have higher per capita LFO burdens. So poor neighborhoods have higher rates of LFOs. And then we looked again over time. LFOs are associated with increases in future poverty rates. And this association is stronger in non-white neighborhoods. So you have an impoverished community with high LFO debt. And then over time, that exacerbates the poverty in that neighborhood. And so we we're interested in looking at that. And we saw that, so this is a, this is a, a figure of the illustration of the spatial analysis. This is actually in King County um, and it's a spatial distribution of LFOs and poverty in the Seattle area. Um, and so if you're familiar with Seattle at all, this is Lake Washington here. Um, this is North Seattle, the UW's right about here. And this is South Seattle. And so I didn't get a chance to look at, at, at your county and look at residential segregation, but many cities, uh, counties are residentially segregated and for a whole number of reasons, and as is Seattle. So really this line here, as you move south through Seattle, it's um, higher rates of African-Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, Native Americans. The color schema here, so the darker you have, it's more LFOs um, and more poverty. So you have higher LFOs through th this area and higher rates of poverty. And if we, and which we've done in other, other um, illustrations mapped on also racial and ethnic characteristics. And you can see that these are predominantly communities of color. So a spatial analysis, if you have address data in, your, in the data that you get, could be really interesting if you, in particular, if you have pockets of residential segregation by race and ethnicity, or you could look at by unemployment rates, you could look at by, by income, education, um, but it visually gives you that gut check to see sort of what's happening. And we can really see some differences here in the city of Seattle, or King, South King County, um, around who owes debt and who's poor. So I think, oh, one thing I did want to know, I didn't want to forget to tell you, on September 29th, so a week from Wednesday, oh, another thing that I'm on is the race and, um, race and justice task force. And it's a task force across Washington State, Gonzaga Law, UW Law, and SU Law. And we, in 2010, compiled a whole bunch of research on race, um, racial disparities and disproportionality across Washington, all the research we could. And we re-upped it for 2020. And so what, hopefully the report will be finalized um, next Wednesday that we're presenting to the Washington State Supreme Court. And there's a link here and I can email uh, the link to you so you can easily um, register if you'd like to. Okay, so I think this is done. Yeah, thank you. So let me get out of here and then we can get into the conversation. Rob, there we go. Alex, I think you had your hand up first. Dan, you're next. Thanks. Um, thanks for allowing me to ask a question uh, as, as a guest. And um, thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, but my question is just uh, around the um, 
legal financial obligation um, disparities that you pointed to by neighborhood, uh, by race and ethnicity, when you and, and by income, when you're looking at those, the numbers that you are reporting, is that based on the initial determination of legal financial obligation, or is that the sort of compounded interest plus fees and what people actually end up paying? Yeah. That's a, that's a super great question. We looked at debt sentenced. We had a problem with getting debt owed. The, the problem was that when we had the data pulled, that was the amount that was owed at the time. And so we weren't certain if that would be an accurate, accurate accounting of, and so we didn't want to be misleading. So it's the debt imposed, the debt sentence. And I need to be more careful with my language when I describe that, but it's the debt imposed at the time of sentencing. So it doesn't account for interest, payment penalties, collection fees. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Dr. Harris for joining us uh, today and thanks for your presentation. My question is, uh, did you study um, uh, length of sentences? Was there any disparities there um, for um, Black Americans versus white Americans? And then did you study um, pre-trial and, and people being held for any length of time? Because of the of you pay? Yeah, oh, regarding, uh, no, we did not um, do that yet. We are interested. So um, Washington has, uh, I didn't say this, uh, Washington State Administrative Office of Court has really good data compared to what we were able to get across my other states. Minnesota has really good data. And so uh, Chris Eugen is the lead there and, and they're doing really interesting analyses. One of which was they looked at the trade-off between sentence length and LFO. And actually at the first cut, didn't find racial disparities in the sentencing of LFOs. Whites had um, higher LFOs sentence but what they found that there was a trade-off. So black people and native Americans had higher for the same types of uh, uh, convictions and records had higher sentences. So they're, they're finding this trade-off that some people are getting higher LFOs whereas some people who are um, people of color are getting longer um, prison sentences. I don't know if that's the case in Washington data but uh, with this new grant, we're gonna start playing around with the data more and asking some of these questions. Yeah, so if you actually have questions of interest feel free to email them to me. At, takes us a long time to get through them and we don't even have the data yet, but we can we can play around with those data. You have your hand up. Dr. Harris, thank you for being here. I really appreciate your presentation. I have, I have a question. You were saying that the next grant you're looking more into um, the past, but now recently in Thurston County, a Supreme Court ruling came out that basically said, DWLS thirds won't be charged, um, or you won't have a DWLS third charge if you can't afford to pay an infraction. So uh, everybody's driving record is gonna be changing um, as time goes on. Are you gonna be able to look into the, you know, into recent changes to see how that affects the LFOs on individuals that had the, the gateway um, charge? Well, we won't, I mean, the data that we'll get are, will, are being pulled now. Uh, we were told, hopefully we'll get them by November, December. So probably not. I mean, you really need, that's another thing about the data. You re really need a couple um, years um, buffer. So the data we, we asked for, you know, the original poll was 2016 that we asked for. So we got up to 2014 because those last two years of data we found aren't usually as accurate or full and have a lot of missing fields in them. Um, so no, so the direct answer is no, but there are other changes. There's Blazina that happened in 2015 about ability to pay. 2018, there was 1783, the change uh, around um, interest and indigency. So there's other legal changes that we can kind of capture, but that's, yeah, you need a leg time from, from the legal change to really capture it in the meat of the data. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Harris. I've loved this presentation and I just want to hear more. I, mean, I have a few questions. Oh, I'm Heather Flaherty. I'm a community representative on the task force. Um, I really appreciate that uh, distinguishing between disproportionality and disparities. And I think that our community, we see disproportionalities. 
And I'm wondering just what advice you would give us regarding like culturally how we get to that next level of understanding whether or not there's disparities and then the taking the steps to address those. Have you, I'm just curious, I know that could be probably like a 25 hour workshop, but in the communities you've worked in, just general advice on how to embark on this journey and really start moving to building strategies to reduce the disparities. Well, for, at first, I really appreciate the work that you all are doing and that you, you care about this so much. I was extremely, I only, uh, full, full disclosure, I only looked at your last year's report. I didn't look at prior ones, but I was really impressed with what you're doing and what you care about. Um, I think, you know, if you were going to create, I like, a, I got a lot of check, checklists, right? The first one is where's the disproportionality within your system is mapping that out and figuring out where is their overrepresentation, And then maybe looking at the steps, the decision-making steps. So that's, so I study institutions, right? And we, and recognize that there's laws, but different decision makers have different ways in which they interpret and apply the laws. And so figuring out what, what were the processes that allowed the individual to get to that stage of disproportionality? And then just going backwards and figuring out, uh, you know, where was the big lump? I mean, we have to remember with criminal justice data that we have a, um, a unique group, a bifurcated group, right? Like a, a very uh, truncated group of folks that end up at the courthouse, right? And, and, and research shows this, it's just not me saying that, right? It's in the community folks are filtered differently according to race, ethnicity, education, employment, set, all these different characteristics. So by the time you have someone within the system that's going up to be adjudicated, um, they're already very different than the general population. And, and you know, depends on the type of, of offense that they're being or citation that they're being there for. Um, so it's important to remember what led to this person to get to the front door in the first place. And that might be, because if you just look at the populations with, who are already in the system that you just look at sentencing or you just look at conviction, you're for, you might not find any disparity, right? Because you have your truncated group. They were disproportionately already pulled from the community because they're being pulled over, they're sleeping in the, in the park, uh, and, and there's different, I hope that that kind of makes sense, but it's just important to track it, to clearly track what are the processes that get to the disproportionality point, and then figuring out what are the decision-making steps that might lead to the disproportionality. Hope that helps. Eric? Yeah, hi. So uh, I heard you say that in the beginning that you didn't have all the answers, and I appreciate that. Um, I also heard you talk about, um, I guess, almost criticize the idea of self-identifying uh, race, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, the best way of doing this? I mean, figuring out a person's, I mean, how, how do I identify a person or let them identify themselves? Well, I think, I mean, I wasn't, I don't, I didn't mean to come across as criticizing self-identification, but I think it's important. So there's been some studies that show that later as at, later in the day, like later at night when it gets dark, that there's less um, pullovers, uh, racial disparate pullovers, right? Because you, the officer can't see the race of the, of the individual, right? So sometimes I think if we're interested in many times in disparity, at least at arrest stage or being pulled over, it's interesting to see the imputed uh, racial category because that's really what matters at that point, what that officer thinks. And I'm not, I don't want, I'm not trying to put down police officers here. I'm just using an example. Um, but what that officer thinks that person is, right? And why that, that however that person is characterized is ra might raise a red flag. But another, you wanna give voice to individuals and to our experiences of who we are at the same time. And so that's why I think it is important to let people self-identify. But sussing out racial disparities, I think it's more about that, that person giving me my race and what they think I am and how that might color the way that they process me and make decisions. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, Lee. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I'm the chief of police in Blaine, Washington. So the question of where the data is is a really fascinating question, even to me as a police chief. So um, my question for you, Dr. Harris, is do you find that uh, the data is just hard to come by or do you find that agencies are not collating or collecting the data in a manner that's accessible to your institution and to your work? I think, um, thank you for that question. I think that, you know, I have only tried to get AOC data. I haven't tried to get into the police data yet. Um, and so like maybe in six months, um, 
I can answer that question better. I do think that the problem is that they're siloed and not linked. So already with the AOC data, my grad students and my, my um, collaborators, we had multiple data files. And so they had to figure out what's going on here. And then some data elements like the columns were different if you match on to what this file had. And so figuring out the narrative, like what was going on and who was coding what and who do we trust, right? If the data was coded by the clerk or if the data was coded in DOC. Um, so I think it's um, not having a consistent structure across all uh, processing points um, is problematic, but that's the, I mean, I, that was like a dream to have, you know, I don't think we'd ever have that. Um, but yeah, so I think data are in silos and then there's inconsistency within the data and that you have multiple people entering data, different counties interpret different data elements differently. So it's really trying to figure out the story. And I think that's for me why it's important for me to have gone into the courts, done court observations to see, well, how is this county using this term? But how, you know, talking to the clerks, things like that to help really clarify the nuances and what, what we might be seeing in the data. So for example, one thing that we found, and I don't know if this is true, but this is what we were thinking is in early 2010 or 11 paper I had published, we did a statistical analysis on a sample of AOC data. And we found that Latinos in Washington state holding priors constant, constant. So comparing across all similarly situated cases, Latinos were sentenced to higher fines and fees. And those data, oh, I think they were in the early 2000s. Um, subsequently, I know that there was a, a commission established or an arm of the Supreme Court because they have those study commissions that was interested in exploring costs imposed for language translation. And they found that in certain jurisdictions, Latinos were being charged for the cost of having a language interpreter while other languages were not. And so that might be that disparity finding that we had, right? But I'm not certain, but that's what I'm thinking of. So it's really important that I, you know, that's why I like to, to do these talks and make relationships with you all. And so I can ask you questions. If we see something funky in the data, you can say, oh, that's because of this, right? Because we really don't know what's going on and what's being added or not. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Thank you. Harris, I, I think I was naive heading into this, um, thinking that we had a problem with the hard numbers, getting our hands on them, and then seeing what they told us. And then I, then I looked at your background and saw your emphasis on qualitative research. And I hear now how important the analysis you do and the, the interviews to understand how, you, how the number came out to be what it was. In a, in a local jurisdiction like ours, get, given a commitment to trying to make some advances uh, in this area, what, what lessons can we take and how, how could we actually implement that, that qualitative level of analysis that you use so that we can really understand and make, make better decisions, not just on numbers, but on what the numbers actually mean? Right. I think, well, I think one, it's neat that you have a, a great sort of um, sample of folks across your county that do the, the work with related to the criminal legal system here. And so I think hopefully <clears throat> some folks would just open up their books. Like the counties have their, I mean, um, municipalities and the courts have their own books. So it'd be interesting to work with your clerks in your courthouses to try and figure out, do they have, is it on an Excel sheet? How are their data compiled? And is there a way that you can combine the, the data to create one data set? But then really sitting down and saying, well, what does this data element mean? What is it, you know, in, in the AOC data, we had a, a, I think it was called waived column. And we had to figure out what that was. And it was a lot of the judges actually were waiving LFOs, the uh, discretionary LFOs at certain points along the case. So that made it kind of difficult to calculate the real number. Um, so then being able to go back and, or even having a workshop and, and going through all of the data elements where you combine data sets to say, well, how did you in, I don't know, you're in Bellingham, right? Interpret that data element, but how did you over here interpret that element to see if it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of labor. <laughs> it's a lot of sitting down conversations, interpreting, running analyses, having interesting questions and saying, how the heck did we get here? Um, and that's, again, that's what's been really useful, particularly in Washington state where some judges are really interested in this question and we can go back and forth or some attorneys as well 
Um, one thing I wanted to say is that um, early on, someone talked about having a problem with uh, not having resources for support for constructing these systems. Increasingly, there's a lot of foundations that are interested in criminal legal reform and are willing to assist counties and cities in creating data, you know, either sort of helping them manage their data. Um, we could maybe talk offline, but Arnold Ventures has done that. They had a city counties grant um, and well, Microsoft too. I don't, I mean, I don't work with them, but they partnered with our task force to create an app. Um, so we could, I'm happy to have a, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five -on -five meeting where we brainstorm places to ask for funding to help create. I mean, it's, frankly, it's, it's pathetic that you have to ask third party people to help pay for creating infrastructures within our government. I'm sorry, no disrespect at all to the government representatives on this call, but you know, I, I know money's hard to come by, but there are resources out there to try and hustle to, um, to get assistance. I think we may follow up on that offer uh, to, to have another conversation. I, I happened to see a, a presentation on the app I think you were referring to with Microsoft at the Access to Justice Conference, and that seemed very interesting. Right. Um, Raylene, sorry to keep you waiting. No, no problem. Thank you, Stephen. I um, just kind of want to touch on what you were saying and, and ask Dr. Harris, which you mentioned earlier about the algorithms to identify certain uh, races, um, you know, the Hispanic, Latino, and, and the Asian with names. I, as working for the court here in Blaine, as a municipality, we see um, misdemeanor charges that we're not really seeing in the jail at this time due to uh, different issues. But most of the municipal, actually all of the municipalities, and, including district court, all use AOC. And Superior Court um, uses AOC, so we get a lot of our data from there. But you know, trying to look at the data from the court uh, and then the police, as you said earlier, it's it's really hard to combine all of that information and to set that up. What I would be interested in is is looking at is there a way we can use that al algorithm um, to identify certain areas in our jail or in the information that we already have from EOC? Well, so that would give you um, the algorithm regarding the surname analysis um, only sort of allows you, you have a data set, you run it on the names and that'll give you a column regarding either uh, Hispanicity or, or Latinx or Asian American ethnicity. So that's all that algorithm will give you. In terms of trying to figure out where there might be disparities or disproportionality, there's no, um, there's nothing that you can run. You need a statistician that can go into your data and start looking at descriptives, looking at correlations between different types of variables, and then ultimately running statistical causal models that will allow you to hold constant. Uh, so you can look at this proportionality. That's, that's easy in Excel, right? You can look at, you know, what's the representation in this county or the city, and then look at what is the representation within, you know, say jails. That will give you disproportionality, but to suss out disparities, you really need to use some type of statistical modeling that will, in your in your computer, it holds constant prior record, current offense, and then looks at outcomes. So if this person, if you have say a white person and a black person that have a similar prior record and, and a similar conviction, you know whatever the offense is, do will they have statistically is one group more likely to have more severe sentencing than the other? And so a statistician uh, will allow you to do that. One way to, to mandate this and to get state support is just recently I mentioned, I had talked with people from WASIP, I always say it wrong, Washington State Institute for, is it public policy? I don't know if I said that right, but they're the research arm, right, for the state legislature. The state legislature mandated an analysis of um, LFOs, a report, uh, one report due December this year and the next report due next December. And so they're mandating that this group of researchers call the data themselves and do the analyses across the state. So that's one, you know, you can put pressure on the state legislature to say, hey, we, and, and work with other counties to put pressure to say, we really need to understand this. We don't have the infrastructure or the, the time or the statistician to do this labor and then put it on WASIP. I didn't throw them under the bus, but put it on WASIP to do that analysis for you. Thank you. As we, as we wrap up this section of the agenda, um, 
Lieutenant Caleb Barrickson has had the thankless task of chairing our index committee, which is information needs and data exchange and trying to wrap his arms around what data we have and don't have and, and how we work together across jurisdictional lines. And Caleb, I just want to invite whether there are any questions that come to your mind or comments you want to make uh, in regard to the information Dr. Uh, Harris has shared with us, just give you a chance, uh, not trying to put any pressure on you here. Oh, thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Dr. Harris, for your presentation and your time here. Um, I have a lot of questions and I'm writing stuff down. I was hoping that perhaps afterwards uh, I could email you some things that I have. Again, they're lengthier questions that may take a little bit more time than maybe we have in this format. But. Sure, sure, yeah. Sometimes it might be easier if we just set up a call or a Zoom too. Um, but if they're easy, I can do it on, on the weekend. But otherwise, if we can set up a Zoom, that would be easier. Appreciate it. We Thank can, you. We can work on that too, Caleb. So Dr. Harris, thank you so much for uh, generosity of your time and expertise here. Um, and and as, as I hope you got the impression, uh, we will probably want to be following up and, and uh, diving even deeper into this. Um, uh, I, I think you, you saw correctly the uh, the priority that we give here locally in Whatcom County to some of the issues that you're uh, you're working on, um, and so I, I think I think I see at least that you could be a tremendous resource to us, and and uh, um, so thank you for this information, and uh, we'll we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you all so much for your work. I really appreciate it, and I, I definitely want my research to matter. So if I can uh, interact with any of you, I'm I'm here. So thank you. Have a great rest of your week. Okay, you too. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, for your interest and your engagement in that conversation. Um, and I, I think we will be carrying it forward. Um, so the next uh, topic on the agenda is uh, trying to update ourselves on the status and the effects and the uh, potential developments in the package of police reform legislation that came out of the 2021 session. There were some initial reactions uh, across the criminal justice and uh, public service um, uh, sectors and uh, some subsequent developments in terms of uh, uh, opinion coming out of the uh, attorney general's office. And uh, I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion amongst legislators, law enforcement, uh, court systems, and elected officials locally. And so I thought it would be important uh, for all of us to try to get on the same page, our level of understanding and our, our appreciation for the content of those discussions and potential prospects for going forward. So uh, Representative Shoemake and Representative Rammel, we're, we're really appreciative that you would join us today. And I thought maybe we could start out with giving each of you a little bit of time to speak from the legislative perspective on the legislation and on uh, what you've been hearing from your constituents, uh, uh, both professional and lay. Um, and then perhaps hearing from uh, Sheriff Elfo, uh, Prosecutor Ritchie, um, Chief Simon, Chief Tanksley, and electeds, uh, Council Member Buchanan, Council Member Hamill, um, and then anyone else, uh, just so we can uh, get a current sense of the lay of the land and, and the, the road ahead. Um, Representative Shoemake, you want to start? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all for having here. That was so interesting to hear about our criminal justice data as well. Um, I spoke to a lot of people last year when I had my campaign. Um, I heard people that said, defund the police right now. And then I heard people saying, don't you dare defund the police. And it was almost like, um, you know, this is the fun work of government and organizing and building consensus is that when I, when I talked to them past the slogans, I found that people actually agreed on a lot of pieces. And I think that there's uh, some fundamental principles that probably everyone on the Zoom room agrees with as well. And I, I would add the first one is um, everyone deserves to feel safe in their community. And that was usually something that I responded with. And I, I think 
probably everyone deeply believes that. Um, the, the other three things that I came out were the three principles from these conversations that had pretty broad consensus. Um, and one is that police need to be held accountable. And I, I would argue that everyone needs to be held accountable for their bad actions, but especially um, some public servants, right? Like we have special rules on accountability. Um, the second one that I heard was, people really want us to use de-escalation and to prioritize de-escalation. Um, you know, a lot of times in these situations, someone hasn't necessarily even been charged with a crime. And so making sure that we're treating them with care is really important. And then the third one that I heard was people wanted to hear, see mental health instead of punishment where possible and where reasonable, right? That um, we really wanna see our community members get better and stronger. And there's there's no joy in punishing someone because they messed up somewhere along the lines or they got hit with a, a bad draw. And so we went to Olympia with that um, kind of these principles and thinking about them. And we worked with the other legislators and I held a number of, um, Deborah Lakanoff held some public justice um, round tables. I had multiple meetings with um, police chiefs in Whatcom County, as well as individual officers, as well as union representatives to really hear and suss out. And, some of the bills changed as a result. Um, there were things that we heard from the community that said, or from officers that said, this isn't gonna work for my small police um, force. And so we changed it and we tried to amend it. Um, we may not have fixed everything. Um, I'll, I'll definitely admit that. Um, and it sounds like y'all have more work that you need us to do. And so I'm excited to be here and hear from this. And this is, you know, this is a big, system with lots of interlocking parts. And I really believe that good policy should be quite boring because you've worked out so many pieces of it. And so my goal is that when we look back at this in a few years, we say, gosh, you know, when I really think about it, things were different there, but they're better now. Um, but it's not some big revolution, right? It, it's, it's a, it's a um, evolution of how we see policing and how we think about criminal justice. And Alex has some things that he wants to talk to you about as well. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I, I think it's really valuable to to always kind of uh, start off with those sorts of um, you know the principles and why we're why we move forward with the the policy changes that we did. Um, uh, so I don't want to take up too much time, sort of rehashing a, a lot of things that have been discussed quite a bit already. So I, I'll, I'll kind of start in the middle of this conversation, if it's okay. And if folks want to ask questions, we can go backwards a little bit. But I, th I think you've had presentations from law enforcement and others about some of the impacts of uh, and the implications of some of the policies that have been passed. And there's been plenty of discussion about that in, uh, in uh, many other forums as well. So I'm, what I'm going to try and do is just talk through a little bit as we've gone around talking with uh, law enforcement, um, as we've talked with other legislators about what's happening in other parts of the state. Um, my experience representing um, not just Whatcom, parts of Whatcom County and Bellingham, but uh, five cities and uh, across three counties and talking with some of the different ways policy, these policies are being uh, interpreted in those different jurisdictions. So I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about sort of sort of the the flashpoints uh, that are the things that kind of come up in each of these conversations, and do my best. Um, you know, my crystal ball is uh, only so good, but I, um, I I think I can sort of tell you where I think the policy conversation is moving and what we will likely see and how folks in the legislature and in state government are trying to address some of the concerns that are being raised. Um, and uh, so I guess I would start with um, House Bill 1310, uh, which is perhaps the, the has gotten the most airtime. Um, and I saw in your um, uh, in the agenda that you had um, noted the attorney general's opinion. And I think to me, that was perhaps the most concerning um, uh, point that we had heard that it was being interpreted in some jurisdictions that um, that bill limited police uh, law enforcement ability to respond uh, to behavioral health uh, welfare checks. I don't think that that it does. I can tell you um, with certainty that that's not the intent of anybody that I've spoken to. Um, and I think the attorney general's informal opinion uh, bolsters that. I hope that at this point, um, law enforcement agencies um, across the state are 
interpreting it in a manner that's sort of consistent with that. That, that may not be the case yet. And, and still trying to figure out in some cases where there's a policy decision being made by law enforcement versus interpretations in sort of edge cases made by you know individual dispatch officers and um, in fluid and immediate circumstances. So trying to understand that, but the intention is very much uh, not to limit the kinds of uh, calls that law enforcement would respond to, simply to make sure that they're using the appropriate amount of force uh, when, when they arrive. Um, I think there's a policy uh, choice that's um, uh, make it that's um, that's one that warrants discussion, and we probably will have further discussion in the legislature inherent in that bill, which is sort of the distinction between um, use of force uh, for reasonable suspicion, uh, which had been the standard, versus probable cause, uh, which is now uh, the which is the standard going forward. Um, and I think there are. I am learning, and I think a lot of us are learning that there are some cases in which, um, on at least a temporary basis, a low level of force makes sense under reasonable suspicion. And I think uh, we will probably debate legislation um, that um, reduces the limitations on law enforcement, particularly in crime scenes that are um, um, active. Um, or where you know suspects are, are there are trying to leave. Um, I think the other cases that um, we need to make sure the intent of the law is clear uh, relate to involuntary treatment, um, other kinds of court orders, um, and uh, youth runaway situations, which are not explicitly discussed in the legislation, uh, but we've we've heard that there are varying interpretations and concerns that. Uh, force isn't allowed in those circumstances as it had been in the past. I don't think it's the intention to limit uh, of the legislature to limit use of force in those cases, uh, but I think we need to make that clear. Um, just touching briefly on a couple of other uh, pieces of policy are uh, 1054, the use of force bill. Um, I guess the 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 Two big concerns we've heard related to that um, are in uh, uh, law enforcement pursuit circumstances. And again, I think that goes to the policy choice of whether to um, allow um, the use of, of that tactic in, um, um, in cases of probable cause um, out and or uh, reasonable suspicion. And I think we have a list of cases, uh, types of uh, crimes um, in which those pursuits are allowed. Um, I think we'll probably have further discussion about whether that list is, um, whether there are some additional crimes which belong on that list in which it's allowed. Um, and then the other question that's come up there is the use of less lethal um, weapons, uh, bean bags, and sponges, uh, which I, I guess are technically larger than 50 caliber. Um, I don't think that's the intent of the legislation. Some police departments are choosing to interpret that that's uh, that those less lethal alternatives are allowed uh, under. I think that's the intent of the legislation. I expect. Uh, that we will likely clarify that um, in the coming year. Um, and then I guess the other the other uh, policies I just touch on briefly. I know there's a lot of concern uh, about uh, the potential for decertification, um, the criminal justice task force. Um, my sense is that. Um, that those concerns um, over time, we're going to see that those the decertification is applied in the most serious cases of law enforcement officers who are abusing their authority and their power, um, and that's the appropriate place uh, for decertification. Um, I think it will be helpful to get. Uh, more clear policy guidance uh, and policy statements from the Criminal Justice Task Force 
And my hope is that those will help alleviate those concerns uh, that a sub and law enforcement see as sort of tying their hands. And then um, the last item that I'll, I'll touch on and we can, we can delve into other things as well. Um, you know, one of the things we've, we've heard is challenge, uh, relates to challenges uh, in law enforcement recruitment concerns that this is sort of, um, that these policy changes um, have made it more difficult for um, an already challenging circumstance uh, for law enforcement agencies uh, trying to bring in new officers and, and keep up with the pace of, uh, of, of need. Um, and that it's potentially accelerating uh, retirements. And I guess um, I, I've asked about this in every meeting I've had with um, uh, law enforcement, um, police chiefs and, and sheriffs. And the most recent conversation I had really helped me kind of wrap my head around it a little bit better and clarify my own thinking. Um, what, what I heard was that um, this challenge of, you know, folks, finding it more difficult to find people who want to go into law enforcement um, has been accelerating over the last few years. And I don't think it's related to the legislative actions. Um, I think it's related to perceptions of injustice that have been part of the media um, and some of what we've seen, um, especially last summer. And my hope is, and I think, um, many others in the legislature's hope is uh, that people will want to be peace officers when we do a better job of building trust um, in a sense uh, that those peace officers are trusted by the community. So I think getting this package of legislation right um, will help to address that concern rather than exacerbate it. That's my hope at least. Um, and I think at this point, happy to pause, take questions, hear other perspectives, really here to take notes and make sure that as we're planning for the next legislative session, we've got the whole list of things we need to work on uh, in front of us. Thanks. Eric, I see your hand up and Sheriff Elfo, you came on and I'd like to hear uh, any comments you have after Eric. Uh, Rep Representative Rammel, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. I think it's fantastic that you're here to talk to uh, this, this uh, I guess group of, of varied um, interests and input. I uh, I believe you when you say that what the legislative intent is, and I and uh, I have to talk to you about thirteen ten and mental health. I, I, I believe you about that. However, I think there are some problems with looking at legislative intent. Uh, you only look at legislative intent when the words are not clear within the statute. I mean, that's that's the way you do it when you're reading the law when you're trying to when the court's trying to decide what uh, what the legislative uh, what the legislators meant so you don't get to that when the words are clear and the words are clear here the words are clear that uh, police can only use force when there's probable cause of a crime and that eliminates the mental health uh, I guess uh, care uh, section that that ha police have always used I mean, it eliminates it. Yes, police can respond, but they can't use force to help people get to the treatment that they need. And I don't believe that the attorney general indicated anything further than that he believes that the police can respond. And I think that's absolutely true. But responding doesn't mean using force to help them get where they go, are supposed to go. And that's uh, that's traditionally what's, what's happened. So uh, I, I have to say that that, that that piece of legislation needs to be fixed. I think that our community is demanding that. And uh, you know, I appreciate again that you're talking to us today. Now, um, you also mentioned something about the intent for shotguns and, and you know, less lethal weapons. And uh, again, I appreciate that. I appreciate the, that you're looking at it, but that too is clear language within the bill. And that means that you only look to legislative intent if it's not clear and it's clear so you can't. So that too, is something that needs to be addressed. I also appreciate that you're talking about the uh, types of crimes for pursuit. That's, uh, you know, it's way too narrow. Um, and I, I can tell you that I've learned more from talking to police about how pursuits happen, how it happens organically and, and how it must happen organically if we're going to protect our community. And it's more than just 
the limiting the types of crimes, but it's also limiting the amount of knowledge that the police officer has to have before initiating a pursuit. And then there's a timeliness issue too. And I'm sure that uh, our law enforcement officers that are here can tell you about that, about how much time it takes to uh, initiate a call to their uh, supervisor. And it might, you might wanna think about make that requiring a um, permit, requiring permission when as soon as practical. Um, that's probably a, a, something that you need to, to look at. But, but right now um, we have some pretty clear legislation and it, and it does tie the hands of law enforcement. And I appreciate that you're talking about it and thinking about fixing those things. Thank you. So Alex, why don't you take a minute to respond and then, then we'll have uh, Sheriff Alfo and I see Dan's hand up as well. I, I just wanted to, to ask a clarifying question uh, for um, Eric. The, the, the first points you were making on the behavioral health response, is, is that specific to Involuntary Treatment Act cases or are you talking about welfare check? Uh, situation. I'm talking, I'm talking about, well, I, I, you know, I wish I could pull up the section in, in RCW, I think it's uh, section 95, 97, um, not, eh, I'm not real sure right now, but it's, it's uh, there are statutes that allow uh, people from the mental health community, uh, emergency medical community to ask for support. Mike Hilly can tell us exactly what that is, but they ask for support from law enforcement. And, it, um, and there is a section that allows law enforcement to uh, help take a person to treatment, but there's no sec that section does not allow force. The only section that allows force is what's been what is now being codified in uh, Senate Bill 1310. And that's what limits force now. It limits any use of force unless there's probable cause of a crime. And so it, it, this is a clearly written piece of legislation in my mind. And I don't think that we're going to be talking about intent or AG opinions that will fix it. It's going to take new legislation to fix that. Want to comment on that or? Uh... I'm sorry, you broke up uh, just a section, Stephen. Were you asking me to comment or? Uh, no, I was asking Representative Shoemaker. I see your hand up, and I wonder if you wanted to weigh in on this point. Yeah, I'd say with both two of the points that um, Prosecutor Ritchie brought up with the beanbags and the Involuntary Treatment Act, I was actually just on the phone with Senator Peterson, who's the chair on the Senate side, saying that these are things that he's expecting to be fixing this next session. Um, so we have heard that loud and clear. That was um, the that was not the intent, um, as Prosecutor Richie very clearly said, um, and we do need to clarify that language. Sheriff Alfo, any, any comments you want to add? Yeah, uh, thank you. And first, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Shoemake and uh, Representative uh, Rammel for the prior meeting that we had. Also, I might want to mention Representative uh, Rule has also met twice now with the Police Chiefs Association to discuss this. Uh, I agree with everything prosecuting attorney Richie has said with regards to the plain meaning. Uh, our officers on the street are, are confused. Uh, we hear the about informal, confidential legal opinions from the attorney general's office regarding the, the use of force in, in the context of the caretaking function. And, uh, but he hasn't issued that publicly he has an issue he issued it to a member of the legislature and it's an unofficial opinion it doesn't have the binding effect of law and it's something we don't want to have to have our officers in a precarious position of, of relying on particularly when we're getting contrary uh, legal advice so if that can be fixed in terms of involuntary treatment and add on the juveniles that would be very helpful i'm glad we're looking at the uh, reasonable standard uh, reasonable suspicion standard and the probable cause standards as they apply to uh, Terry stops and pursuits. We've discussed that at, at the last meeting. Uh, as far as uh, use of force and less lethal, you know, I think that the controversy is a 12 gauge shotgun, which was the platform for delivering bean bags. Uh, we've solved that by buying air guns. They were expensive, but they're actually more accurate and they uh, uh, have a, a higher probability of reducing injuries or unintended consequences. So 
Uh, we're dealing with it that way. And I've got to also add that most of the other sheriffs around the state that I speak to are receiving similar advice from their prosecuting attorneys. Uh, they're on board with what Eric's recommendations are to us. So this is a statewide issue. And I would just urge uh, the representatives to also hear what the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, I think it's a very credible organization. I think they could be very uh, of much assistance to you in looking at potential consequences. Uh, I just want to add on the decertification process. I wholly support the decertification process uh, to get rid of uh, bad officers and keep them from becoming uh, re-employed in law enforcement. Uh, prior to this, uh, there had to be a finding from their own agency that they had committed some serious misconduct before the Criminal Justice Training Commission, which I sat on for 12 years, had the power or authority to decertify them. So. You know, if they could let somebody go with a quick resignation and not complete an investigation, that would have been problematic. So I, I agree wholeheartedly that the commission should have the authority to look into that. But there was a, uh, a, uh, a provision in there that allows the commission to decertify officers on the basis of derogatory social media posts. And we certainly don't want derogatory things that could affect an officer's credibility, but I think that's uh, the officers are taking that that well, you know, that if I have a that could be attributed to my political positions or my religious affiliations and just some clarifying even through the whack by the criminal justice training commission as to what would be grounds for decertification would certainly uh, put some of that at ease. Uh, and, I, and I've got to say that uh, with the mental health de escalation that's. You know, we're not, our deputies have not been out there to punish people. They've been there. We have mental health deputies. We try to get people into treatment, uh, something we've been working on for a long time. All officers are, are deputies are trained in that. And I think that's pretty much uh, countywide. Uh, we've made our mental health deputies available to the small cities when they need them. So I don't think we have a, a approach where we're out to punish anyone, but, uh, I know this is a statewide issue, so we'll look forward to uh, working with you on that uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Dan. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Reps uh, Shoemake and Ramel, for, for joining us today. I appreciate your, your presence here and listening to the concerns of the, of the group. I've got three uh, general areas. They're all kind of related, and I think I've discussed these with you before, but I just want to make sure that they're still on the table. The first one is the ART, the alternate response team that we've been working on. This, uh, these teams would respond to um, certain types of behavioral health calls. Uh, during a long period of data analysis in the beginning of the year, uh, we came back with um, about 4% of the calls that uh, get dispatched to Whatcom and Prospect could be, um, could be responded to by an alternate response that would be a behavioral health specialist and an EMTB. Um, my concern with that is that I wanted to uh, see if it would be possible to have a, um, an officer accompany certain calls that these that these teams would respond to. And um, so that's my that's my main concern is that will we be able to use that officer to respond uh, with certain or to certain calls? So that's one concern. Um, the next is the behavioral health officer program. And it was brought up about. Um, officers maybe not or people not wanting to become police officers what does that look like in the workforce then is it more laterals that are coming across or are any uh wanting to be behavioral health officers given uh some of the you know the items that we're discussing today and then the third area is itas um so my concern there is listening to behavioral health professionals tell me that uh some of their clients end up in jail because there was not that intermediate step of an inter intervention uh, to help them to get them to the crisis stabilization center or whatever the intervening uh, component would be. So I'm, I'm concerned about those. I just want to get some clarity <clears throat> around those pieces and just, you know, the, at the end of the day, I just want to make sure, sure that people get the help that they need. I, I hear from their families that they're just at their wits end because their son or their, their mom or whoever the, the person is is not getting the help that they need from, from a broken mental health system. And then they rely on local resources that are under-resourced. So I just, I just want to get clarity on those pieces. Thank you, 
Stephen. Thank you, Representative Schumick and Representative Rammel. I appreciate you being here today. I also have three areas um, that I bring up and they're kind of interlinked. The first one isn't so much interlinked, but I do have concerns that due to some of these um, changes in legislation that we're gonna see law enforcement that are not sure how to interpret things that are going to be more reactive than preventative. Um, and I would hate to see certain things happen because they're too concerned about some of the issues um, that, that could help prevent crimes and prevent people from being in the criminal justice system because they're only reacting to the calls that are there. And I, I could be totally off, um, but, but that is a concern um, as I've seen some of the numbers decline. And I'm not sure if it's just COVID or, or everything else that is interlinked at this point. The other thing I have concerns about is funding um, for some of these mandates. I have not heard any of the law enforcement supervisors, chiefs, say anything bad about cameras. They, they've all been very positive. They want um, the officers to have the body cams, but um, funding for that isn't always easily available. So I worry that when we put some of these legislative mandates in place that we don't fund it. Uh, Sheriff Elfa pointed out that they found an alternative to less lethal weapons, but um, not all the small cities can afford those options. Um, so then you see some things escalate and not have the funding to, to take care of these issues. The other issue is the mental health providers. Um, we found statewide, nationwide, that there is a lack of mental health providers available and we need to provide incentives for that. I know that a lot of these police reform laws were based on we want to defund police or people want to defund police and they want to provide more mental health treatment. But if you can't get them into uh, treatment providers, whether it's domestic violence or mental health or drug treatment, because there isn't providers out there, um, we're going to see more crime. It's just kind of fact that we need to see what we can do to bring in more mental health providers to our area. Thank you. Thanks, Raylene. Um, sure, if I'm going to let Chief Tanksley go first, and then you um, just give him a shot at, at commenting. Chief Tanksley? Yes, well, thank you, representatives, for being here today. Uh, you know, first, I want to start off by saying uh, there are several of these um, laws that we certainly uh, appreciate and we certainly uh, are on board. For example, HB 1089, the compliance audits, SB 5051, oversight and accountability, the sheriff mentioned that, and also SB 5066, which is the duty to intervene. Um, in fact, the duty to intervene, many agencies were already doing that uh, per policy. Uh, with regard to what Raylene King mentioned about the unfunded mandates, HB 1223, which is the electronic recording um, mandate, simply uh, without saying it does require every agency to somehow record on January 1st, 2022, any felony arrests or juvenile custodial interviews and that's audio and video. Uh, so there, right now, many agencies within the state are uh, scrambling, trying to find funds to get body-worn cameras. I'm an advocate of body-worn cameras. Um, I've warned them. Uh, they are a useful tool. However, um, it can be costly. So um, here in the city of Blaine, I had to really uh, dig and scratch to find the funds to be able to implement this before January 1st, 2022. And right, uh, we still haven't totally implemented yet. Uh, in fact, we just purchased the cameras, which are not here yet. So my ask would be that for these type of laws to have some forethought to think about how agencies are gonna pay for this. Um, and lastly, in terms of HB 1054 police tactics and pursuits, uh, it is very restrictive, especially for smaller agencies. So I'm not gonna rehash that because it's already been talked about today, 
But again, um, there are many of the new reform laws that we embrace. Um, and for the most part, I think a few of them need to be tweaked. And I think we should be good to go. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to uh, build on what uh, or, uh, Council Member Hamill said. Uh, we have all these alternatives for behavioral health. We have a new crisis stabilization center and it's not functioning at full capacity. One of the things that law enforcement uh, insisted upon in the beginning was that we'd be able to take people there as involuntary commitments. Uh, they're not accepting involuntary commitments over there. They'll take along people who are willing to go and get the help. So that's no different than the uh, previous triage center and they've limited the capacity instead of the 16 to 10 on the mental health side uh, because of staffing issues. And I understand why they're not able to do things. They said they have a broken camera system over there. There's some problems. But if we're going to uh, be able to rely on these, we, we need to have that system up and functioning. And, and that's uh, something the social service uh, community uh, is going to have to figure out. I know Ann Deacon was working on it and her last day was Friday, so we're at a, a big loss here. And, the, and similarly with the, the drug treatment, the two referrals to treatment uh, prior to making an arrest, I mean, that's come down to giving people a pamphlet with phone numbers. That's, that's really not a, a meaningful diversion from my perspective. Uh, and people know they can get two diversions and they, they kind of tell the officers, well, I haven't, I've only had one warning and, uh, and we're seeing that not just with the sheriff's office, but with all the, the jurisdictions countywide. And one thing I added, I, I had on my list, and I forgot to mention is we could, if we could quantify how much the quantity of drugs someone may have in their possession and make a presumptive ruling. If you have X number of drugs, in your possession, that goes up to a, a presumption that they intended to deliver it. Uh, the way the law is written now, somebody could have uh, five kilos of heroin, and unless we have other evidence of intent to traffic or intent to deliver, uh, that the quantity in and of itself does not uh, show what we need for the courts uh, uh, to, to prove an intent to deliver. So. Uh, I know Oregon, they had a different approach to criminal uh, criminal decriminalization, of, decriminalization of drugs. They did it legislatively and, you know, perhaps look to them as to what quantity limits they, they, uh, they placed on it. That would be very helpful if we're going to prevent uh, dangerous drugs from being brought into the community for profit. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and insert myself in here with, with two comments. Um, one is I just want to emphasize uh, the fact that we've, we've done some pretty creditable work locally to create resources and diversions uh, to prevent and reduce incarceration, um, which re re rely on uh, a previously inadequate uh, behavioral health and substance use disorder treatment uh, system. Um, and the demands are even greater now, Put, putting aside any, any problems in getting from point A to point B to, to use those resources. So I just wanna encourage our legislative representatives to think of the fiscal needs here to expand that system. There, there clearly are workforce issues that are long range problems. But there are shorter range problems with the uh, with the capacity assist of the system right now to do the kind of work that we want to do as alternatives. Um, and so uh, please make that a priority in the coming session. And, and lastly, I'm encouraged uh, by the conversations that have already gone on and the fact that it, it appears there's there's a fair bit of consensus on some of the uh, clarifications and changes that might uh, be forthcoming in the session. Um, I know Alex arranged for a conversation with Representative Goodman as well. Um, and, and all of that seems promising. The uncertainty that's lying out there in the community is, is pretty critical. And so uh, I, I know you've got to order uh, how you take up things in the, in the coming session. 
if if I could uh, encourage as strongly as possible that this be up near the top of your priority list to get these measures uh, passed and into place so everybody can be on the same page and everybody can be functioning uh, in an optimal and connected uh, way so we can move from point A to point B to point C in these diversion uh, um, processes, uh, I think we'd all be well served by that. Um, Alex. Thanks. Um, and I know that we've got about 20 minutes left. I don't know if you have other things you need to get to on the agenda. I um, am appreciating this discussion a lot though and um, taking notes and, and find it really valuable. Um, if it's okay with you, Stephen, I'll just respond to a few of the uh, few of the points that were that were made. Yeah, please do. We do we do have one other topic on the agenda we want to get to, but uh, I think we have a couple more minutes on this. Okay. Um, so um, first, just responding, um, Councilmember Hamill, on the, your question about alternate response teams and whether uh, law enforcement can accompany them. I don't think that we've done anything uh, that limits where, what kinds of calls law enforcement can respond to. Uh, again, I think the law 1310 limits the situations uh, in which force can be used and directs them to use a minimum amount of force necessary, but I don't think it has any uh, impact on the um, kinds of calls that law enforcement can, can be involved in. If I'm missing something, if I'm wrong on that, I very much would like to hear that. Um, I would also say uh, behavioral health response teams um, really um, would, would just note um, the Blake decision legislation that we passed that, that um, responds to the Supreme Court decision on decriminalizing um, um, drugs. And the, one of the key parts of that legislation was significant increase in funding uh, for behavioral health uh, resources, some of which is going to be administered through programs uh, that are sort of state level, but some of which is going to be directed to local agencies. Um, I don't have an update to share on the allocation of that funding. It's a question I've asked a couple of times uh, over the last month. There isn't anything uh, new that I can report on that, but um, it's definitely something I'm, I'm tracking. I know it's important and we'll make sure you all are in the loop um, as soon as I know anything else. Um, but on the on the question of uh, reasonable suspicion and Terry stops, I just want to acknowledge that this you know this conversation comes right after the last one where we're talking about disproportionality um, and disproportionate impacts uh, in criminal justice. And um, so when we're talking about reasonable suspicion and what circumstances uh, that's a standard that uh, we want to have used, that's a that's a complicated uh, and important policy discussion. Um, I don't think uh, that we're done having that conversation. Um, it's, it's a long one. I'm happy to, to dig in further uh, with folks. Um, on, on the question of funding to local agencies, um, I do just want to emphasize uh, the legislature allocated $50 million for implementation of these policies this year, uh, 30 million of that for counties, uh, 20 million for cities. Um, I, when, when we were discussing that, my understanding was that that was mostly for things like um, training and soft costs rather than capital costs and equipment. Uh, but I know that, you know, for example, in, in Whatcom County, it's being used uh, for new equipment. Um, I suspect if it's equipment that um, that dollar figure is a little bit, uh, is, is not going to be sufficient to cover all of those costs. Hear that, but also don't want you all to, to go home thinking we didn't think about the costs or just expected you to, to eat them. Um, Really just wanna note 100% um, here what you're saying um, on the need for um, mental health uh, providers. I, I do just wanna push back on the, the note of, about defunding the police. And I will say that I didn't hear anybody have a serious policy discussion uh, in the legislature in the open or behind closed doors in which we said we're trying to punish police. Um, our our uh, intention is to defund uh, the police. What we talked about is what's the best way to help people uh, in our communities. And, and, and 
think that is uh, the approach that we had going back to those first principles that uh, Representative Shu make uh, referenced. Um, and then I will just end um, two notes, emphasize um, you uh, Tanksley, your note, um, that many agencies, um, many police departments were already implementing a lot of these policies. I just wanna lift up that comment because I think it's important. Um, a lot of times what, um, you know, when we pass these policies, folks feel like, why are you trying to make us do this? We're already doing it. Um, if you're already implementing the best practice, uh, the policy, the law wasn't uh, really focused uh, on, on at you. It's it's focused on uh, perhaps some of the other communities that are not as far along down this path. Uh, and along those lines, just want to also emphasize, Stephen, uh, the point that you made, uh, the incredible work, uh, pretty incredible work uh, to reduce um, uh, offenses and reduce incarceration that this committee has done. I just want you all to know that I'm proud to um, represent a community with this task force uh, working in it and really appreciate uh, the, the leadership you all have shown over the last few years and the hard work you're putting in. So thank you. Thanks, Alan. Alex. Uh, Dan, if, uh, if I can ask you to be relatively brief and then I'll let uh, Representative Shoemake uh, wrap up with a couple of comments. Yeah, I'll be I'll be very brief. Um, so I want to make a finer point on the comment that I made earlier about the four percent of calls for behavioral health and why we would want a uh, police officer to respond with the um, behavioral health teams in some circumstances. It's because Whitebird Clinic in out of Eugene, Oregon, claims eleven percent of their calls that they were able to respond to. So I want to see if I can close the gap between that four percent and the eleven percent. And so it would just be to to go to different to understand and learn about what different types uh, or call types that they that those teams could respond to with the safety of an officer. That's why I just want to make sure that point was taken. Thank you, Dan. And Representative Shumay. Yeah, and I think too, Dan, that there's another piece of that, um, that fixing the involuntary treatment reference, um, going making it clear that the use of force did not mean to interfere with that, should be able to fix that as well, that we could use officers to respond and even um, you know, use force in situations where it may not be criminal, but we have those involuntary treatment acts effects. Um, another thing that I heard here a couple of times, um, there was lots of really great stuff. Um, one, I would like to point out that um, part of the Blake decision response was also creating this recovery navigator program. And I heard some um, concerns that, and maybe not today, but other places too, well, you're supposed to get two referrals to drug treatments, who keeps track of that? I do think that should be a statewide program. Um, you should be able to, you know, um, uh, get in trouble with drugs in Bellingham and then twice and then have it switch back to zero if you move to Ferndale, right? That's a little silly. Um, but also there's a recovery navigator piece of this too, because it's not just the drug treatment, which we know we're lacking the resources for statewide, but also making sure that when someone gets out of drug treatment, that they're not going back on the street or back to the people that put them in that situation. And so we need to think about wraparound services, which brings me to my final point, which um, you all are actually a lot of the people that design some of these services. Um, in 2019, when the crisis triage facility needed funding to continue to run, um, council member Buchanan came to me and explained to me um, the situation that they were in and the desperate need for this funding. And I will go to the legislature and I will say, we need half a million dollars to make sure that we can do this program that is supposedly gonna save money, um, but may not fit in the existing programs. And the more you have these innovative pieces that maybe don't necessarily fit into a grant, if you can time it with the legislative cycle, um, I know Alicia and I would be proud to take these um, programs and show other legislators what we're doing and talk to them around the state. Um, Alex Rammel would be as well. Um, I think I could probably speak for the 40th representatives. Um, this is really important work and we don't have all the answers. And so it's gonna be people like y'all seeing needs in the community, figuring out what the solution to is innovating and um, you know, repeating and measuring, right? And all these things where that first conversation of the data is also really important. So we can make sure that what we're doing is actually being effective. Um, so I, I really want to open up those conversations. Um, the timing is kind of funny because it's, you know, we have the legislative season, which is in the beginning of the year. Um, but even things like, um, we can fund things like body cameras too, and other innovative ideas, um, or really innovative ideas um, 
to kind of do this work because I do think it should save money, um, but it's also the right thing to do. And it's, you know, we all have family members that have been in mental health crisis or have been involved in the police. And every single one of those people in the jail is somebody's little baby that they kissed and hugged and loved, right? Um, and so this is just, this is critical work to me. Thank you very much to uh, Representative Rammel, Representative Shoemake, Bill, Eric, Dan, Chief Tank, um, and others uh, on the task force who've contributed to this conversation. Um, looking forward to sort of resolving some of the questions and uncertainties, clarifying, improving uh, what I think is, is a pretty uh, significant range of common interests uh, across all these uh, participants. And uh, slowly but surely, I think we'll get this right and get this better. Um, thanks everybody for, for taking part in this conversation. Um, so the next item on the agenda is a recommendation for uh, communication to the County Council on the use of ARPA funds. Uh, Dan, I didn't see that Mike was on this, so I, I, I think uh, you're bringing this forward. Heather, I know you had a hand in this and, and uh, feel free to chime in. Um, we're a little bit limited in time, but maybe we won't need a lot of time for this. Um, so Dan, why don't you start it out? Yeah, I'd like to just uh, begin this conversation. This is packet page six uh, of your packet. This is a, a letter um, that was passed unanimously in the behavioral health subcommittee of the task force. And uh, I'm going to let Heather Flaherty take it away here to explain in a finer, um, finer detail. Thank you, Dan. Um, hello, everybody. It's 1053. I hope you're all listening. I see lots of dark screens, but I'm assuming you're listening. Um, uh, so Tyler Schroeder, Deputy Executive from Whatcom County. Hi, Byron. Hi, everybody. Oh, it's nice to see faces and smiles. Um, you may recall a couple months ago. Hi, Caleb. Uh, Tyler Schroeder came to us and said, hey, we have this American Rescue Plan Act opportunity, some big dollars coming to the community. Um, we'd love to hear what you think we should, how we should be prioritizing these. So uh, the Behavioral Health Committee of the task force um, took that request really seriously and said, okay, here's an opportunity for us as a task force to use our collective voice share some perspective about the concerns we're seeing, barriers to our goals, um, as, especially as they relate and have been exacerbated by the pandemic, which ARPA dollars are supposed to be helping. Um, and so these top four categories came up and there's a couple sub subcategories um, and, and uh, of where we wanna say, hey, Executive Sidhu, we think that if you have opportunity to use some ARPA funds or other public dollars to address some of these issues, we'd like you to think about that. And we want to be partners in those discussions as well. The number one is behavioral health workforce. Um, we're hearing that as a barrier in so many discussions. And I think just culturally, we are in the middle of a transformation and we don't have the diversion and treatment built up that we need to in order to actually be diverting people away from the jail, which is where I think we're all headed as a community. Um, and so this is coming up over and over again that people cannot find the workers they need um, to deliver the care that our community needs. And that has been exacerbated by COVID. Um, Pre-trial and re-entry support, those are really vulnerable, critical times in somebody's um, journey through the criminal legal system, and uh, cases have been stalled because of the pandemic, so it's an appropriate use also of ARPA dollars. Um, this big dream, we also, number three, is the 24-7 mental health urgent care which would be a little different than the crisis stabilization center, but we hear over and over again that there's not a safe place to take people who don't belong in the ER and who do, don't belong in jail. And so if we have $30 million and we could build a facility um, and there's examples of, of how other communities have done that, Providence and Everett has a, has a behavioral health urgent care model. Um, and then the last one is supported in transitional housing. Um, and there's a there's some case statements in this letter too about uh, graduated care and making sure that people are just supported through their housing um, journey. Uh, and that's been exacerbated by COVID as well with more and more people um, facing the potential of evictions and things like that. 
The other two priorities are uh, youth mental health broadly and data. And I think if you read through this letter, so much of the discussion we've had this morning um, is woven throughout this letter. And, and I think this is an opportunity for the task force to say, here are some things that we think are really important. We know the list is actually 100 items long, but these are the ones we're elevating to the top right now and, um, and build some community awareness around these priorities too. So it's here before you today for hopefully your vote of endorsement um, to advance it to our county council. Um, and I know that there were a couple of additions people wanted to see. Arlene, you wrote some really awesome language around the need for 24-7 behavioral health care. What I'd like to suggest so we don't go into wordsmithing and spend four, four more months making this perfect is that if you have additional thoughts, um, like Byron, Mike, you may have very specific ways that you could support this letter that um, you could write your own letter and kind of add it as uh, like from Byron or from Arlene, here's my um, letter of support for this letter from the task force. So that would be my suggestion. So today I'm hoping that there could be a motion and, and approval of this letter to move forward. And any questions, of course, about um, the content or just uh, how we came to these priorities. Well, I, I will add that this letter was also endorsed by, uh, and I'm preempting uh, Raylene and Arlene here, is uh, endorsed by the Legal and Justice System Subcommittee as well in the joint meeting. Uh, it, it sort of bypassed the steering committee and came straight to the task force uh, because there's, there's a pretty significant time sensitivity to this. We wanted to get this in front of Executive Sidhu uh, as he started to shape his budget and at least see the priorities and the buckets that, that we recommended for uh, direction of, of ARPA funds. Um, so if, if there is discussion, um, Eric, and then if anybody wants to uh, uh, put this forward in a, in a motion. Um, uh, I move to approve. Second. All right, so we have a motion to approve the letters presented to us uh, recommending use of ARPA funds and a second. Uh, is there further discussion on this? All right, um, in that case, uh, everyone in favor of the motion, if you could signify either verbally or with a thumbs up, uh, uh, please do so. Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? And since I can't see everyone, I'd ask you to verbalize that opposition. I hear none. Any recusals? I don't, I'm, I'm not registering any. Uh, motion is carried and uh, we, we will uh, get this communication on the representative or executive Sidhu. And uh, Dan, Raylene, Arlene, uh, and Heather, uh, thank you very much for, for doing this work and, and helping us communicate what our needs are. I think, I think we're gonna, this has been a pretty dense, pretty intense uh, meeting. Uh, frankly, I think it's been enormously helpful in, in a number of uh, ways in moving our work forward. Wanna thank everybody for participating. I'm going to forego the committee updates at this point, and uh, Jill, ask you if you want to uh, solicit public comment. Yes, thank you. We have four attendees at the meeting right now. If any of you would like to speak to the task force, please virtually raise your hand. No hands are raised. Okay. In that case, again, I'll thank you all for being here today and taking part, and uh, this meeting is adjourned. See you next time.